<laughs> you sound ready to go. Isn't it amazing what three days of good weather will do for us all? Yeah. Glad you're here. I did want to say thank you. Uh, uh, so many cards and notes and comments uh, for pastor appreciation. Uh, our team just uh, considers it an honor to serve you and to serve our community. And uh, to hear uh, from, from you that uh, you think we're getting some things right is encouraging. So thank you so much for that. And uh, you might not know this, today is actually the 13th anniversary of Pastor Jonathan Sigmund being on staff at Calvary Assembly. That's right, yeah. So uh, he should get extra credit for, for putting up with me <laughs> that long. Uh, and not far behind him, actually, is uh, uh, Pastor Steve Otto, pastor of uh, children's ministry. Uh, they both came on staff uh, in proximity to each other. So we're grateful for both of them. Um, just want to make one more thing, make you aware of one more thing, and that is uh, you probably have noticed lots of people are really struggling with uh, anxiety these days. It has a capacity to exhaust us. It has a capacity to create distance between us and others. So many people are struggling with this. And, and I'm grateful for uh, the medical community and the psychological community and the work that they do to try to help people dealing with that. I think there's also a spiritual component. And actually next week we're going to be talking about how Jesus saw and talked about worry and anxiety and fear. And uh, along with uh, uh, every other good thing that people are doing to try to gain traction in their life and fighting fear, I think there's a lot of wisdom in approaching Scripture and finding out what Scripture has to say about it too. Amen? All right. Well, uh, Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount. We, we're in the Gospel of Matthew. If you don't know, I think this is week nine. And uh, we're, we're going through and, and seeing this incredible biography of the life of Jesus and capturing his teachings. And, and his uh, Sermon on the Mount starts mostly by, by him telling his disciples. That's the people he's primarily talking to. Though while he's talking, huge crowds are coming. And he just keeps talking. And, uh, and so lots of people overhear this, but he starts by telling them, if we're going to multiply our capacity to be healers in our communities, then we have to learn to see people differently than we tend to. So how do you see people who are suffering? How do you see people who are struggling? How do you see people who are persecuted? And what we can see them as, as potential recipients of blessing, that God has blessings for each of them. And then uh, uh, Sarah just did a phenomenal job last week talking about the lessons of Jesus. And what we learn is how we can treat people with incredible respect. So how do you see others? And then, and then how do you treat others? But now Jesus goes into a portion of the teaching that really is quite remarkable. How are we to be seen? And this, this, uh, this is really a, a, an incredible thing for us to think about because there's a part of us that wants our faith to be noticed and then a part that wants our faith to be private. And what's true is we can practice our faith in a way that winds up pushing someone else away from the kingdom. And so Jesus goes through a series of talks and he basically gives us this information. Don't be that guy. You know that guy. Don't be that guy. So let's look at what he has to say. It starts in Matthew 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. <laughs> That's interesting. What does a life of faith look like? Like if you take your faith seriously, what does that look like? Do Christians dress a certain way? Is there a dress code for Christians? When I was growing up, there was. And even what I have on today would not have qualified. <laughs> uh, is it the way you use your voice? Is it, is it using the King James Version uh, language? You know, throw a couple of these and thous in there and then people know you, you, you're, you take your faith seriously. Um, 
How do we live out our faith in a way that actually calls attention to God and not to us? This is, this is a lot harder than it looks. Seeking God's attention actually leads to faith. But the challenge is we don't always seek God's attention. The truth is we all want to be noticed. That doesn't mean we all want a lot of attention. But when you get something right, don't you wish somebody saw that? It's one of the, if you've ever been at, at games in, in uh, 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 kids in school or uh, what you'll notice is if they score, if they make a good pass, if they do something good, one of the first things they'll do is they'll look to the stands for where they know their parents are. Did you see that? They want, to be, they want you to have noticed, right? Also, when you do something wrong, you check real quick. I hope nobody saw that, you know? We, we don't. And when we're struggling, we kind of want people to notice that too, right? We don't want to go up and tell them, oh, it's really hard, I'm, I'm having a hard time. We'd like them to notice something. So in some ways, we want to be noticed. So how do we incorporate that, that desire, that innate desire to be noticed with living out our faith and do it in a way that's, that's healthy? And there's the challenge. So in verse 2, Jesus goes on to, on to say, When you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpet, trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Everyone gets a reward. Jesus does not say, hypocrites do not receive a reward. He says, they received the reward they wanted, which was the attention of other people. And they are paid in full. They should not assume that God has any additional obligations to them. Faith, the way Jesus teaches it, is that it seeks to be unself-conscious. <laughs> How do you do that? less impressed with ourselves and not trying so hard to impress others. See, we all want to be noticed, but that's a little bit different. It's, it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Um, uh, it has popped up on my uh, social media a few times where uh, someone is singing for the first time in front of their friends. Anyone seen anything like this? If you haven't, it's... Uh, a, it's interesting. And uh, usually the way it plays out is uh, a person and their friends will be in the car and they don't know that they can sing. And there's a song on the radio, uh, probably not a radio. Nobody uses radios anymore, right? That's ancient technology. Um, whatever the device is, and, and the song comes on and all of a sudden the person starts belting it out and everybody in the car goes, oh, And, and they do things. Humans have interesting things that we do when we're really surprised. They, they open their mouth really wide and then they cover it. <gasps> and what, what's going on? And it is so interesting to watch the face of the person doing the singing because they're noticed. And they're noticed for something that they're good at. And it's people who didn't know that about them. And when you see something like that happen, you go, well, that's not bad, right? And it's not. But there's a way that that concept can be corrupted. See, if we do that in order to get applause or approval or compliments, then something inside of us starts to warp. And it gets unhealthy. So here's how to tell if you're on the healthy side or the unhealthy side. When you don't get the compliment, how do you feel about that? Because that's, that's an internal diagnostic. 
See, learning to serve without calling attention to ourselves, not actually easy. And what Jesus says is God sees everything. Even when you're serving in secret, you're trying to do it anonymously. You don't, any, you don't want anyone to see it. God always does. So when we're looking to help, when we're trying to serve, when we want to bless, what is our reward? Is it the compliments, the acceptance, the approval that we get from others? Or are we going to allow God to be the one to decide what our reward should be? In verse 5, it says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen, then your Father who sees what is done in the secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus starts by telling us you can create a holy space by closing a door. It can be any door. The size of the room doesn't matter. That when you close that door and it's just you and God, it becomes a private conversation. And this is what's interesting. We talk differently when we're in private conversations than when we're in public ones. I know there are a few exceptions to those rules and they always embarrass all of us. <laughs> but the truth is, is that we talk differently in private conversations. Now this is not a prohibition against public prayer. Public prayer can create a sense of community. Public prayer can, can show a support to others. It can show care for others. Like all of that is true. But public prayer is not supposed to be the place where we impress someone with our knowledge and our language and our stamina about how long we can go on praying. Has anybody else here besides me ever been held hostage by someone praying a long prayer? You just can't get out of it. You don't, you just know if I get up and walk out, they're going to think that, that I'm not a believer. And, and so there I stand. It is with this, with this, 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 this hostage. <laughs> it's not fun. You know, Jesus says, your prayers are not about trying to prove anything to anybody about how much you know or what your, what your prayer vocabulary is. Faith assumes God is generous. You don't wear him down with your words. You know, I know there's some people, you can wear them down with your words. But God is not like that. In fact, if you want your prayers to be really effective, make them brief, make them frequent, make them intense. And it's absolutely amazing how more likely we are to pray when we think we don't have to make a certain word count or go a certain amount of time on the clock. We don't do that with anybody else. I want to have really good conversations with my wife, but I promise you, I don't go in and say, all right, could you not speak with me for an hour today? You just start the clock. All right, go. It's just, if anybody does that, you can't think of anything to say. We don't wear Jesus or God down with our words. Chapter 7, we're actually going to learn about persistent prayer, but persistent prayer is not based on God's unwillingness. A lot of religions in the world basically teach that repetition is what builds kind of a, an energy force, a, a spiritual collateral in a bank that you can draw from. Just more and more words add up to more and more influence with God. And Jesus said, don't be like that guy. That doesn't work. God knows what you need. That's what he says. God knows what you need. So then doesn't that demotivate you from asking? And the answer is no. The people you are most intimate with and who know what you need more than anyone else, you have very open conversations with them. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Then he says, pray like this. And so the, the Lord's Prayer is going to be up on the screen, and I'd like us all to recite this together and out loud, and let's all use our outside voice, okay? Here we go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The prayer Jesus teaches is short and it's simple. Interestingly enough, it comes right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's divided into two parts. The first part is about your name, your kingdom, your will. The second part is about us. Give us, forgive us, lead us. Prayer reminds us at the very beginning, the first word, that it is about our relationship with God and others. It's our Father, not just my God, my Father. We're in this together. How many are glad that God is not just only your God, but he's the God of all? Amen? And so good, that's good news, right? And by saying that, our reminds us we're in this together, but Father also reminds us that it's relational, not just some force that we can tap into, but it's based on relationship and it's based on authority. That there is at least a season in our lives when our Father has some authority over us. Now I understand there can be unhealthy expressions of, of fatherhood in our world, but that doesn't come from God. And so what we see here is, is it, the word Father shows relationship and it shows authority and he reminds us that we're all in this together and then in heaven, which is kind of wherever you go, you can see the sky, right? It, it's a picture of, of omnipresence. He's everywhere. And it's also a picture of that we can lift our eyes from the things that distress and distract us every single day. And that we can cast our eyes on something greater than all of that. In heaven. Hallowed be your name. What does that mean? It means that we want God to be taken seriously in our world. We're asking for the reputation of God to be based on truth rather than on imaginations or accusations. And it's not a command. It's not telling God, you know, do a better job with your reputation. It's an expression of a desire. I want everyone in our world to know what I have learned about you. And I want to keep learning even more about you. We want everyone to take you seriously. Your kingdom come. There's a lot of governments in our world and a lot of humans uh, sit in seats of authority and they have a desire to try to help and make things better. Whether you agree with them or not, that is their goal. And, and the problem is, is that they're limited in their resources, they're limited in their wisdom, they're limited in their knowledge, they're limited in their lifespan, and they're also easily corrupted. The longer you're around power, the more likely you are to be influenced by that power in unhealthy ways. And what we are being reminded here is that the future of our life and our world is not being determined by limited individuals in limited governments, that we have a king who is king of all kings, and we have a Lord who is Lord of all lords, and he is always going to be on his throne. That's a really good thing. And he says, your will be done. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Your will be done. What's his will? Well, he's been telling us we're to be people who bless. We're to be people who show respect to others. We're to be people who live out our faith in ways that doesn't call attention to ourselves. And this is interesting. We're taught to pray that God's will is to be done on earth. Why? Because it's not always done on earth. Oh, I know there's some fatalists around that will tell you everything that happens in the world is designed, pre-programmed by God. And, uh, and my only argument that I care to make about that is, so how is it in heaven? Is anyone dying in heaven? Is anyone suffering in heaven? Is there any disease in heaven? Is there any grief or loss or addiction in heaven? Is there any limitation? Is there any disability? Is there any sorrow in heaven? And the answer is no. And the question is why? Because God's will is always done in heaven. That's what makes it heaven. What makes our world less than heaven is because our wills get involved. Everything we don't like about our world comes from the expression of someone's will other than God. So we pray. Let your will seep into our world. 
God has not come to rid the world of us. God has come to rescue and redeem us. And this is what's interesting. We don't just pray for God's will to be done in my life, but in our world. That's interesting, right? And we say, your will to be done in our world, and it's not just limited to what I can do. I'm very limited. We should find some comfort in the reality that God's will is capable of being lived out in our lives and in our world beyond our ability. Does anybody find any comfort in that? Because I'm a very limited person, but God can do way more than I can. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. If you didn't get your daily donut on the way in, it'll be waiting for you on the way out. Yeah. And... Uh, so what's Jesus saying here? He's concerned about your, your, your daily needs. It's not selfish to ask for what you need to, to survive, to be healthy. But what's interesting is he doesn't pray for miracle manna, it's bread that shows up and you, and you eat it. Um, I happen to like bread. My heart really goes out for you folks that that are gluten intolerant. Um, and I, I mean that, because uh, there's only one bread in all the world I've come across that I didn't like. And no, I'm not gonna tell you where it was. But bread requires crops to be grown. It requires whole economic systems to work. For you to get bread on your table, someone had to grow it and it had to be distributed and that created jobs. And then you actually had to have a job where you could afford to buy the bread. Like there's a whole economic system around that. When, when you have bread on your table, a lot of people have benefited. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. It's, it's really bold to ask for a debt to be forgiven. You could try it. You go into the bank and just say, I was wondering if you would forgive my mortgage. <laughs> it's going to be a short conversation. <laughs> Such amazing grace. And technically, God just doesn't wipe out a debt. He accepts Christ's payment for it. Some of us has come to realize that we need more than bread to survive in our world. We need forgiveness. That's what we need. Guilt and shame, they dehumanize us in a lot of ways, but grace dignifies and liberates us. And then uh, asking for forgiveness and offering forgiveness takes faith. And uh, a lot of us don't feel worthy of the forgiveness that we receive. That takes faith to receive it. And then a lot of us don't feel able to offer forgiveness to others. That takes faith to try. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. So is the evil one the devil or is it some bad person in our life? And the answer is yes. Wherever the evil one exists, we need God's help. And we need to be led because our culture is filled with landmines of temptation. And we can so assume that we have fixed whatever our weaknesses are in life and I don't need any help. But the truth is, is that I will tend internally to find reasons to be in places I should not be with people that I should not be hanging out with, doing things I should not be doing. When I get my way, I wind up in places I shouldn't be. When I follow God's way, he leads me in a way that I'm protected from myself. That's a really interesting thing. Deliver us from the evil one. Then Jesus adds some information on forgiveness. He's not quite done there. So he says, for if you forgive other people uh, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others your sins, their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus wants to remind us, unforgiving people will be unforgiven people. That's how serious God takes it. And then he goes into a spiritual discipline. Uh, when you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites do. They disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face and, uh, so that they will, it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is 
unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, fasting is a way we humble ourselves before God. It's not a hunger strike where we're trying to force God to give us something that we want. I'm not going to eat until you see this my way. It's a way of focusing on God's presence, but also God's direction in our life. And it's, it's not an easy thing. And there are people that when they would fast, they wanted everybody to know, like they wanted to get credit for fasting. So they would mess up their clothes and put on their worst looking face and no, no makeup if, if, and, 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 and mess up your hair and, oh, oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fasting. Just, and Jesus was not at all impressed with that. He says, when you fast, uh, put some product in your hair, <laughs> comb it up, wash your face, look the best you can. Is he asking us to pretend anything? No. Jesus is never about pretending. But he understands that what's happening in that moment is when we want everyone to notice, is we want credit for doing something. And Jesus is concerned about that. So he says, dress normally, wash your face. That our tendency is to call attention. We want credit for the good stuff we're doing. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. People will not be attracted to God by our long prayers. People will not be attracted to God by us taking credit for things. People will not be attracted to God by us making it look like our spiritual disciplines as a source of suffering. Long prayers and taking credit and a lack of joy is not faith, it's self-righteousness. You were not made to be ignored. God sees you. He won't ignore you. Faith doesn't require you to put on a good show. Faith is simply living for God's attention and God's approval. And people are attracted, hear this, people are attracted to people who aren't trying to prove anything. Do you know what that is? That's confidence. And we see so little of it in our world. If I do some thing, God noticed. If I pray a prayer that nobody else hears, the one who can make the biggest difference did. If I give something to help someone out, even if it was anonymous, God's paying attention. If I'm engaged in a spiritual discipline, because things in my life could be a lot better, if nobody notices but God, he's the one who gives the greatest rewards. Would you bow your head with me? It's possible when I have a talk like this that you, you can beat yourself up pretty good. It occurs to you that you're doing some of those things that Jesus said, don't be that guy. And uh, what I want you to know is you're not disqualified out of the kingdom. There's a lot of us that are those guys lots of times in our lives. But Jesus still keeps calling and he keeps teaching and he wants us to get it. Of course you want to be noticed and there's someone who notices it all. Every good deed, every prayer, every whisper, every tear, every struggle, every failure. And he's there for you every time. So Father, help us today to live for you in a way that the only thing that really matters is that you saw it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll stand to our feet.